Yo gang, welcome back. Okay, so this video here might be a little bit on the longer side, but it's because acid-base stuff is going to come up all the time, whether we're talking about something in OCHEM 1 or OCHEM 2. So I want to hit it, and I want to hit it hard. Okay, so before we get into any problems, doing any problems or anything like that, I want to quickly rehash what the definition of an acid is, what the definition of a base is, and what makes a strong acid or base, and what makes a weak acid or base. Okay, so a little throwback to Gen Chem. Uh, we're going to use in this, in organic chemistry, you will use the Bronsted-Lowry definition of an acid or a base. And we'll go over that real quickly right now. Okay, so let's just use our good old friend HBr as il to illustrate the definition of a Bronsted-Lowry acid. Okay, so the definition of a Bronsted-Lowry acid is that it is one if it is a donator of H+. And here's what that means. So, we just need this to be a source of H+. Donating means that it will produce H+. So really what we need to see out of HBr to make it a Bronsted-Lowry acid is if, when put in water, will it produce H+. And if, if we do, I'm going to tell you that we will see uh, H plus and Br minus produced. So yes, this is a good example of a Bronsted-Lowry acid. Okay, so if that's an acid, what's a base? Well, instead of a donator, it would be an acceptor. And here's a good example of that. So I'm going to use NH2 minus. Okay, so basically, you can see that he's negative and he's looking to grab or react with anything that's positive, right? Because we know opposite uh, charges attract each other, right? So if you can see, if we had some H plus lying around, doesn't matter where, you bet your bottom dollar that he's going to just swoop in and grab him, right? Making him NH3 or ammonia, right? So that's the difference between an acid and a base in Bronsted-Lowry world, is that Bronsted-Lowry acids, or acids as we'll call them, like to produce H plus. Meanwhile, uh, Bronsted-Lowry bases, they like to pick up H plus, they like to accept H plus, okay? So, one last thing before we get into the problem solving, I just want to talk about the difference between being strong and being weak. Okay, so I said to erase that to make more room, but let's look back at HBr. Okay, so I bet from Gen Chem, you know that this is a strong acid. And remember that being a strong acid means that when you're put in water, you dissociate a lot, or you dissociate completely, right? You completely become H plus and the other ion, Br minus, right? So that's called being strong. Now I just want to make a quick point. So we know HBr is a strong acid, but every time we have an acid that dissociates, right, this would be, so this is just H+, plus, right? This is our conjugate base, right? Conjugate base. And here's the way that this goes. With conjugates, if you come from a strong acid or base, your conjugate whatever is weak, right? So Br- minus is going to be weak. If HBr was a weak acid, then Br- would be a strong conjugate base, but that's not the case. So we can kind of go backwards. Since we know Br- is a weak conjugate base, then the acid it came from must be strong, and that's kind of how this works. So let's quickly look at a base example. So I'm going to tell you guys that NH2- is a strong base. So if we were to protonate it, or if we were to give it a proton, right, if we were to give it H+, plus, then we would have NH3, right, because we would just be adding this H plus to here. So if we know that NH2 is a strong base, this is a strong base, then we know that the conjugate acid, NH3, ammonia, is a weak acid, a weak conjugate acid. So that's how that goes. If you come from something that's strong, your resultant, so strong acid or base, your conjugate acid or base will be weak. And if you're looking at something that's weak, it must have come from something that's strong. Okay, so let's get into some rules and predict some acid-base equilibria. So in the beginning of your OCHEM 1 career, you're going to see a lot of acid-base problems where you're going to have a balanced chemical equation with an arrow going forward and an arrow going backward to indicate a forward and a reverse reaction. And someone is probably going to ask you, okay, pick whatever side of this equilibrium, this acid-base equilibrium, is favored. And you're, we're gonna, we have five rules that's going to help us determine which side you're going to pick, which side will be favored equilibrium. I promise this is not hard. As long as we can remember our five rules, we'll be good to go. Okay, 
So we're going to take them one at a time. First, we're going to, uh, we're going to use electronegativity to help us to, uh, determine which side of an acid-base equilibrium we're going to have. So I'm going to throw up an example problem. Okay, let's do water plus NH2 minus our double-sided arrows that would can indicate a forward and a reverse reaction goes to hydroxide and NH3. Okay, so here's our acid-base equilibrium. Our job is to decide is the left side or this right side favored equilibrium. And here's the mindset we need to go through. So we want to pick the side where we have a molecule bearing the negative charge that is the most stable. Because we know nature tends towards stability, right? Nature does things that is favorable and isn't ridiculous, right? Stability is key. So basically what we need to figure out, who bears this negative charge more effectively? NH2 minus or OH minus, right? And these are where our rules come in. These, the five rules we're going to discuss will help us determine who will bear negative charges more effectively. Okay, so in this scenario, electronegativity is our deciding factor. And here's why. So basically, we're going, like nitrogen here is bearing the negative charge in this atom, and oxygen is bearing the negative charge right here. And this can be determined by formal charges. Okay, so if we were to look at our at a periodic table, and I just need to show you a little snippet of one, in the same row, in the same period, nitrogen, oxygen, and actually, I'll draw it here, fluorine is over here. Okay, so we know electronegativity is a measure of how much an atom likes to pull negative charge or accommodate negative charge, right? We know fluorine is the most electronegative atom, and we know that as you go to the top right corner of the periodic table, electronegativity goes way up, right? Okay, so knowing that, we can tell that oxygen is more electronegative than nitrogen. He is more comfortable harboring or holding a negative charge, right? So it goes without saying that OH minus is a more stable, more comfortable with holding a negative charge than NH2 minus. So if we're going to pick this equilibrium, I would say this side is a more stable outcome and is thus the favored side at equilibrium. And there's also a different way you can kind of say this. This is like the qualitative way. But if we know some things about the actual strengths of these acids and bases, you can also do it like this. NH2 minus is a very, very, very strong base. Stronger of a base than OH minus. So he's going to do his job and take a proton from water because he's stronger than the base over here. So the equilibrium goes this way. But you can also do it with electronegativity too. Okay. So the next rule we're going to discuss is size. Okay, so now that we've moved on from electronegativity, now we're going to talk about size. So let me throw an example problem up here. Okay, one second. Got our double-headed arrows over here. We've got ammonia, pH2 minus, and then we would have NH2 minus, and then we would have pH3. Okay. So to give you a little idea of where we are kind of on the periodic table, because nitrogen and phosphorus are the guys that are holding our negative charge in this scenario. All right, we call those electrons. So on the periodic table, they're in the same column. Okay, so this is what we got going on. So if we know anything about moving down a column, we're adding energy levels, but more importantly, what that means is that we're getting our size is getting bigger of the atom, right? As we go down, just maybe let's say nitrogen is this big, phosphorus is this big, right? So spherically, we're getting bigger. So how does that help us determine who holds this negative charge better? Well, we know that like charges repel each other, right? So if phosphorus is bigger than nitrogen, if we have the same amount of negative charge between these two, the charge will be able to better distribute itself around phosphorus because there's more space to spread out, right? There's less repelling of each other of this negative charge on a bigger spherical surface or just a bigger surface than there is with nitrogen. So I would say because phosphorus is bigger than nitrogen and this negative charge can better distribute itself or spread out over the surface 
of phosphorus than nitrogen, I would say that phosphorus holds the negative charge more effectively, and this side is favored equilibrium because pH2 is more stable than NH2 with a negative charge. All right, that's all about size. So next, we'll talk about how resonance helps us to determine which side of an acid-base equilibrium is favored. Okay, so let's see how resonance helps us pick which side of an acid-base equilibrium uh, is favored. All right, so let me draw this up for you. I'm gonna throw it to some, some bond lines, so stick with me. Let's say if I draw, uh, this would be ethanol, but it's actually called ethoxide, which we'll get to later. That plus acetic acid, double-headed arrows, then we'd have acetate ion plus ethanol. Okay, so what's the mindset here? Well, here's how we kind of go about this. So as you can see, we're going to be comparing these two structures, right? And we're going to determine which one is a more stable form. Well, you can see that there's no resonance to draw here, right? I can't move these electrons. I can't move these here because I can't move anything on this carbon and that will break the octet rule. Covered that in the resonance worksheet and video. Okay, but let's kind of move on over to acetic acid and we do see that we can draw resonance, right? If I'm gonna use the, get a little green marker action in here. If we were to move these electrons right there, I have to move one of these guys because otherwise I'll break the octet rule on this carbon atom right there. But you see I can move him up there. And if I'm going to draw my double-headed arrow to signify, yo, I'm drawing some resonance, the resultant structure would look like this. I have a positive charge on that guy right there, and then a negative charge on that oxygen right there. So you can see that there is resonance on the conjugate base of acetic acid right here, whereas on the conjugate base of ethanol, there is no resonance. So, remember we said resonance is a stabilizing effect because it helps kind of distribute the burden of a negative charge or positive charge across a structure. So you can see that there's some relief here as far as holding a negative charge on uh, an acetate as opposed to this structure right here. So I would say the conjugate base of acetic acid holds this negative charge more effectively and I would pick this side as the more stable side of the equilibrium. Therefore, this is the side favored at equilibrium. So basically, you need to just see, okay, where is there the most effective resonance shown on one side of the equilibrium? That's the side you go with. All right, and the next thing we'll talk about is how hybridization, which we just talked about before, kind of plays into everything. Okay, so now let's see how hybridization helps us determine which side of an acid-base equilibrium we're gonna pick and go with due to increased stability. All right, let me draw this up for you real quick. All right, here's a two carbon structure called ethane. And let's throw that together with this guy right here. Just ethane, but with a double bond. That's actually called ethene. And if we're gonna draw our, our forward and backward reverse arrows, we would have here, this guy right here, and we would have that over there. Okay, so what is our thought process here? How are we gonna go about this? So the only difference between here and here is hybridization, right? If we're going to kind of fill in this guy's, uh, the rest of his bonds, right? He has one, two bonds right here, three kind of bonds with the lone pair, right? And then one bond to hydrogen. So if we're going to count his bonding areas, right? It would be one for the double bond, two, three. So he would be, we would need an S, a P, and a P. So this carbon right here is going to be, you guessed it, SP2 hybridized. Now, if we're going to look at this guy over here, right, and we're focusing on who's bearing the negative charge, right, he's going to actually have two bonds to hydrogen. So he has one, two, three, four bonding areas, S, P, P, P. That would be S, P, three, because we need four orbitals to make that, those hybrid orbitals. Okay. So how are we going to determine who can handle this negative charge more effectively? So let's do some quick percentage math. So you see we have three orbitals here that comprise of the overall hybrid orbital. So it's not too hard to make the, make the realization that each hybrid orbital is 33% S orbital, right? Just one third of the overall hybrid orbital 
zest, so 33%. So if we're going to play that same game over here, right, we have four orbitals involved. So if we're going to find the percent of the orbital that is like from an s orbital, that would be 25% s orbital. Okay, so hopefully, if you remember or you don't, the s orbitals are the ones that are closer to the nucleus and they're spherical, so they're the closest to the nucleus. So uh, if you can see that this, this one has more s character, this one has less s character. The s orbitals are the closest to the nucleus and that's where the protons reside, right? So if we're closer to the nucleus, if, we're more, if we have more s character, that means our electrons are closer to the nucleus, aka they're closer to the protons, and we know that opposite charges attract, and that electro, uh, the electromagnetic uh, attraction is a very stabilizing attraction. So you can see that the more s character you have, the more stable your charge can be hold, held, versus if you have less s, s character, the less stable your charge can be held. So basically, when you're looking at hybridization, you just need to find who has the most s character, and then that's the side of the equilibrium you go with. So I would pick this side to be the equilibrium you go with. So just another quick example to kind of illustrate this, this point, just because I want to make sure it's pretty clear. Usually you don't even have to go through the full explanation of, oh, it's more s character, so it's closer to the nucleus, that's where the protons live. Usually most teachers are just satisfied with more s character, this is the side that has the structure that has more s character, that's holding the charge, that's the side we want to pick. So let's just look at another quick one real quick. Let's say we did this plus this guy, and that gives us this plus that. Okay, awesome. So if we're looking at this, we know he's sp3 hybridized, and if you're already looking ahead, he's the other guy holding a charge. He's just sp hybridized, right? Because we have the lone pair as a bonding area and the triple bond. That makes up four total bonds, so we just need sp because we have two bonding areas. Clearly, you can see we have 25% s character over here. Over here, we have 50% s character. So this is a no contest, right? A complete blowout. This is the side of the equilibrium we're going with. And that's all there is to it with hybridization. We have one more rule. It's very simple, super easy to spot, and then we're done with acid-base stuff. All right, last rule, so stick with me. We're almost done. You can see the end of the tunnel right now. Okay, so our last acid-base rule that helps us pick which equilibrium we're going with as far as which is favored, which is more stable, is the inductive effect, okay? So super easy to spot. Let me just show you. All right, so let's just say we had two potential acids, two potential sources of H+, right? This would be, this is actually ethanol. And let's just say I drew ethanol, but then I stuck two fluorines right there, okay? And now let's just say if I were to draw an arrow down, right, let's just say we lose H+, plus. sorry, this guy's gone. So then we have a minus charge there, and then we would also have a minus charge here, and the two fluorines, okay. So I'll, I'll put this in an equilibrium form for us in a second, but I just want you to, to identify, well, we're going to talk about which one of these is a more stable conjugate base, because then we can decide which acid is stronger, right? Because what it, whichever one is weaker, that means it came from a stronger acid than the other one. Okay, so the only thing that's different between the two is that we have a couple fluorines right here. So let's see what that kind of does. So we know that fluorine is the most electronegative atom on the periodic table. So, you can easily bet that this is a very polar bond. He, uh, carbon has two very uh, polar bonds with fluorine, and these two fluorines are definitely stealing his electron density away. So this carbon right here has a very big partial positive charge, right? That's what the delta plus means. It means partial positive charge. Which is a good thing, right? Because if you look to see what his neighbor's up to, this oxygen has a, a negative formal charge, right? So the fact that this carbon is sporting a partially positive uh, charge, this is going to be an electromagnetic stabilizing effect, right? Because positive and negatives attract, and that's a very stabilizing effect. We don't just have this standalone negative charge next to a neutral neighbor. He has a, positive, a partially positive neighbor next to a negative guy. So I would say that this conjugate base is weaker 
And by saying he's weaker, that means more stable, right? What that also means is that since he's a weaker, more stable base than this guy over here, we can say that this guy, or this acid, is stronger, right, than this guy over here. So let's put that into an equilibria form just to kind of tie this lesson up nicely with a bow. Let's, uh, one second. So, if we were to draw it like this, put the fluorine compound over here, we'll have ethanol right here, draw our arrows, we'll have, oh, sorry guys, I'm gonna have to make this a little ratchet. Okay. So if this is the side that has the negative charge with the fluorines and this is the side that has the negative charge without the fluorines, we identify this guy as being able to handle the negative charge more effectively because he is a more stable base, aka a more a weaker base, right? Then I would go with this side as being the favorite equilibrium in this acid-base problem because, like we said, he's better at handling this negative charge than this guy because these fluorines cause a partially positive charge on that carbon, that partially positive charge is a stabilizing effect next door to the negative charge. This guy doesn't have that, and that's how it goes. So as long as you can remember these five rules, whenever you look at an acid-base equilibria, one of these guys is going to be the governing principle that's going to help you pick left or right, or identify who can handle that negative charge or positive charge more effectively. All right, guys, we have one more video on Gen Chem Bootcamp, and then on to OCHEM. See you later.